do you go completely, irretrievably, irreversibly bad? Walter White is a high school chemistry teacher who's been diagnosed with advanced inoperable cancer. He has no life insurance. And in a desperate bid to leave something for his family after his death, he starts to produce meth. He's a chemistry teacher. He thinks he can do it cheaper, better. He's gonna, he has pride in the fact that he can produce meth in the most efficient, clean, sanitary way possible. Things already start out weird, right? He recruits one of his students to sell it for him on the street, and their business takes off. And of course, along the way, there have to be some compromises made. There have to be some, a little bit of ruthlessness to get past rival dealers and suppliers. But Walter is still struggling to be a responsible husband and leave something for his family after he's gone. And so he continues to go step by step deeper and deeper into this culture of production and dis distribution of illegal drugs. And decision by decision, choice by choice, step by step, one thing leads to another. He murders a drug dealer who is threatening his family. Didn't want to, but he realized unless I kill this man, he's going to keep coming back again and again and again. He allows a woman who is blackmailing him to die of a drug overdose. He hires killers to wipe out rivals. He descends into a pit of murder and extortion and drug dealing, and even his personality changes. His wife notices it. Hey, dude, what are you mad about? <laughs> hey, it worked. <laughs> he had a birthday yesterday, man, and hey, I'm sure he's thinking, when we go places, I want cake now. You understand about Walter White, about White just kind of descending step by step into this, this pit of degradation and hit, pit of hell. He loses his family. He virtually destroys his humanity. People start calling him words like monster. And finally, in the last episode of this show, he dies in a shootout trying to avenge his brother-in-law's murder, which Walter had brought about in the first place. Just... An interesting character study. The creator of Breaking Bad, Vince Gilligan, said, I want the show to demonstrate that actions have consequences. And that's what Walter White's life shows in the five years of this show, Breaking Bad. These small steps, these tiny decisions, almost insignificant choices that he makes. They lead to these huge, terrible outcomes. Walter Williams at the beginning of the show is a completely different person than he is this hideous monster he winds up at the end of the show. And he didn't do it by intent. He didn't do it because he decided to be bad. He just did it because, well, just one thing leads to another, and here you go. When God put Israel into the promised land, he didn't do it solely so they could worship him correctly. He put them there so they could thrive. He put them there so that they could grow up, and, and, and he gave them laws that would bring them freedom. And he showed them how they could establish a society where everyone could be free and could be well off, where the poor could find relief, and where everyone has dignity and honor and he gave them the law so that they could be as happy in the best and truest sense of the word as you can imagine as happy as you can possibly be in this fallen world and he did it because he loved them if that's true then how did Israel get here this is what the sovereign Lord says this is Jerusalem which I have set in the center of the nations with all or with countries all around her Yet in her wickedness, she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than the nations and countries around her. She has rejected my laws and has not followed my decrees. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You have been more unruly than the nations around you and have not followed my decrees or kept my laws. Now that's saying a lot because you remember when God brings Israel into the land of Canaan, he says, the people who live here are so corrupt, kill them all. 
kill the men, women, and children, kill their animals. Don't let anything be left. You get rid of them all because they are so... Now, they've got to be pretty bad for God to get that way, right? This God who loves people and cares about people and nurtures people and works with people and is patient with people and kill them all, he says. And now God says, and you're worse than they were. You have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself am against you, Jerusalem, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nation. Because of all your detestable idols, I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. Therefore, in your midst, parents will eat their children, and children eat their parents. I will inflict punishment on you and will scatter all your survivors to the wind. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will shave you. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. A third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. Then my anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside and I will be avenged. And when I have spent my wrath on them, they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal. I will make you a ruin and a reproach among the nations around you in the sight of all who pass by. You will be a reproach and a taunt, a warning to the nation, a warning and a ho- object of horror to the nations around you when I inflict punishment on you in anger and in wrath and with stinging rebuke. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I shoot at you with my deadly and destructive arrows of famine, I will shoot to destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off your supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you, and they will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed will sweep through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, you understand this didn't happen all at once. It happened one step at a time. One decision at a time, one action at a time, day after day, year after year, generation after generation. Israel just sort of drifted. And it would be hard to see it at first. You know how it is? Just little stuff. You know, you kind of, I know, I, yeah, I miss church once in a while. I got, I got some things that I have to do. Yeah, a little white lie to smooth things over with my husband because it's just easier that way. I'm skimming past a photo of some woman and man doing unspeakably vile things on a computer. And you're, what in the world was that? But then there's another peak. And then another. Or there's another lie. And then another. And another reason to be somewhere else doing something else. And one day you think, when was the last time I was in church anyway? It's just easier to lie than it is to face up to the hassle of telling the truth. I just can't seem to turn off the computer. It, 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 it's almost like it's in control. How do you get so far away from this loving, blessing God who wants the best for you, who opens up the land of promise and says, my gift, enjoy it. How do you get so far from that to a point where God wants to kill you? And not just kill you, he wants these people to feel the shame and to feel the pain. He wants these people to get so hungry that they would eat their children. Can you imagine that? Their deaths are going to be horrible. They're going to be awful. They're going to be torture. God says this way it happened. Ezekiel 7 verse 3, the end is now upon you and I will unleash my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will surely repay you for your conduct and for the detestable practices among you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now, the NIV makes it sound like in verses 3 and 4, makes it sound like God is just trying to get even with them for what they've done. You've done this to me, I'm going to wipe you out. Actually, what the Hebrew says in verse 3 is something like, 
I will judge you according to your conduct, and I will give to you all of your detestable things. Now, that doesn't make much sense in in one way, but if you think about it, in verse 4, he says, no more pity. I will spare you no longer. He says, I will turn you loose, and I will let you, he says in verse 4, he says, I will turn you loose. I will, that repay you for your conduct is, I will give back to you everything you wanted to have. What he means is, I'm going to step back and let you have, whoops, I'm going to step back and let you have everything you have caused. There is no more protection from the consequences of your action. No more merciful intervention to save you from yourselves. I'm going to let you live through the sort of lives that you insist on building for yourselves. And so when you read about all these judgments of God, it is not as though God is wading through them with a sword to slaughter them. He is not the one who is causing the famine that is so bad that they would eat their children. He's not the one who sends the lion or the plague. Instead, their evil conduct has earned them the hostility of their enemies. And their injustice and greed has caused economic collapse so that they're starving. And their wickedness has so depopulated their country that wild animals thrive and the unsanitary conditions in which they live cause diseases to spread. God just simply says, all right, I'll step out of the way. And he lets it happen. What God is saying to the Israelites is, your conduct matters. When you refuse to listen to me, you move one step further away from health and from sanity and from virtue. When you insist on sinning, you are hardening your hearts to be the sort of people who do all kinds of foolish things, and you are destroying your spirits, you're destroying your bodies, you're destroying your relationships, you're destroying your environment, you're destroying your economy. Now, God's promise in Ezekiel is this thing we're focusing on in in this series of sermons about Ezekiel. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. But what God has to do, as we saw last week, is number one, give them a new vision of who he is as God, but he also has to help them to understand your conduct matters. What does he actually mean in in Ezekiel 36, 26? Does it mean that he's going to put his spirit in them so that they will act like robots and just do all the right stuff in spite of themselves? No. He's going to give them his spirit so they can make right choices, so they can do all the things that will bring them happiness and quality lives, and so they can thrive in the way that he intended for them to thrive when he brought them into the land of promise in the first place. And to do that, they have to know that what they do really matters. It matters because of what they are doing to themselves by ignoring God, and it matters because this is the way that God, by His Spirit, will develop them into people of virtue and glory. Your conduct matters. It isn't that God will be angry with you if you don't measure up. You know, we sometimes get that judgmental thing. If I don't do it right, then God's going to hurt me somehow. And I suppose that's reason enough to be careful. But your conduct matters because what you do moment by moment, day in and day out, molds you and shapes you and makes you what you are, either a person of virtue and character who brings glory to God or a person of corrupt character who not only is miserable, but brings misery to everybody around them. Virtue is not something you decide to do and then poof, you're virtuous. Virtue is not something that happens because God said, all right, I forgive you. Virtue is something that is a way of life that is built up by habits of doing what is right. And those habits are, are, are formed one action at a time one choice at a time, one deed at a time. Virtue is a lot like learning to type. How many of you can type without looking at the keyboard? How many of you can type? A lot of people can type. 
what is just shout it out immediately just as soon as I say this what is the what is the letter directly to the left of the F key I heard I heard one D most people just were sitting there going I, I don't even know that's because you don't know what keys you're hitting really do you you don't sit there and think let's see I've got to spell out D-A-V-I-D let's see uh capital D uh, a V I D you just sit down at the computer key or at the uh, computer keyboard typewriter keyboard whatever you at, and you just say D A V I D and that's it you don't even think about how to spell it even it just it just is it's almost like you push all the keys at once you see if I had said type the word demand and you were sitting with a computer keyboard in your lap most of you who know how to type would just simply go Dunk, and it'd be over with you wouldn't have to think now where's the D key where where it let's say one key to the left how did you learn to do that? You learned to do it, remember the first day of typing class? A, S, D, F, G, H, G. And you had to make your fingers push those. Where is the X key? Ah, the X key. I, I, oh, there it is down here. Which I use this finger and push it this way. And you learn, you have to make yourself to do all the things that, that, that lead you to typing faster and faster and faster until one day you realize you're not even thinking about what you're typing, you're thinking about what you're reading or thinking about and needing to put on that piece of paper. You just type words without consciously thinking about it virtue is that way in the beginning you do good things because you consciously make yourself do them i will be kind i will be oops i will be kind but after a while practicing and working hard and learning you are not a person who does kind things you become instead a kind person who naturally does those things God puts it this way in Ezekiel 18 suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and right he does not eat at the mountain shrines or look at the idols of Israel he does not defile his neighbor's wife or have sexual relations with a woman during her period he does not oppress anyone but returns what he took in pledge for a loan he does not commit robbery but gives his food to the hungry provides clothing for the naked he doesn't lend to them at interest or take a profit from them. He withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between two parties. He follows my decrees and faithfully keep my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. Now, I want you to notice what he says about that. He does not say, that man does plenty of righteous things and therefore I am pleased with him. What he says is, that man is righteous. His character, his nature his, his practice that comes out of him. He is a man of virtue who does these things rightly because they come out of his character, out of habit. Now, I know that's what he means because he goes on to say in verse 21, if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them because of the righteous things they have done. They will live. And then he says in verse 24, but if a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness they are guilty of and because of the sins they have committed, they will die. Fonts change size on me. Now understand, God is not talking about the person doing more good than evil. I mean, if it was that way, these people in Israel, in Ezekiel's there, having a hard time, God's not fair. I mean, what if I, what if I do all kinds of great things for 80 years of my life, and then for 10 years I just turn into the greatest villain in the world? Why does that mean I will die? What about all this guy who's done all of these evil things all his life and for 40 years he's been the worst villain you can imagine and suddenly he gets religion and for 10 years he lives a good life. Why does he live? It's not fair. This guy's done a lot more bad things than this guy has done. God said it's not a matter of how much or how little. It's a matter of virtue. It's his virtue that counts. On the one hand, 
a man turns away from the evil he was doing and begins a new life, a life of virtue by learning new habits of right conduct, he will live, says the Lord. And the same way, a man who turns away from the righteousness that he was practicing and begins to develop a different sort of character, one that is shaped by wickedness, he will die, says the Lord. Your conduct, your choices, your action, your habits, all that matters. It matters because the things you do build your character and shape your character, and your character, your virtue, matters with God. There are two very important things that you need to remember. The first one is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. It is easier to be bad than good. All you have to do is not pay attention to how you act. Just give in to every urge you have. Just give, any, in, give, give in to any desire, every desire that taps on your shoulder, and you will find that by default you have become evil and worthless. Virtue takes discipline and concentrated effort. I, I see a person trying to learn view, virtue like I watch some little kid trying to tie his shoes, you know, sticking his tongue out. Well, he's going to get it exactly right, and he's concentrating. And I just reach down and tie my shoes while I'm doing something else because I don't even have to think about it anymore. You need to focus. You need to live very carefully. You need to be careful how you live, Paul says. Secondly, Luke 16 he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is righteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Little things matter. Now, we, we worry about the big things. You know, I'm not sure what the big things are. You know, smoking and drinking and cussing and sex, I guess. I don't know. We get all those big things down, you know. But it's the little stuff that matters. The jokes you tell about people of other races, the sarcasm that creeps into your voice when you talk about somebody that you don't like very well, even, even when doing a job that you said you would do, you just do it just to get through with it and get by with it instead of doing the best you can, you just do enough to get by. It, it's, it's those little things, those are those things that really build the foundation for the big things. If you get the little things right, then the big things are going to take care of themselves. There are two important ways to develop godly virtue. The first one is worship. Worship is important because out of worship we develop habits that shape our character. In worship we participate and we do habitual things. Have you thought about how much ritual there is in our worship? And I, and I mean, that's a good thing. Okay, I know we talk about ritual. Oh, it's just ritual. Ritual is a good thing. Think about your singing. I mean, how many ways can you sing anyway? There's just a few. But we sing the doctrines of Christianity. And we sing the aspirations of our heart. And we focus on how great our God is. And as we sing, week by week by week by week, we are shaping our hearts to be devoted to God in faith and perseverance prayer our prayers aren't just off the wall conversations you know shooting the breeze with god we come to him in honor and reverence and in our need and there are ways of approaching god the disciples said would you teach us how to pray please and jesus said i'll oh, just do it any way you want to it doesn't matter well he gives them a model prayer when you pray pray like this he says it is a matter of ritual, and we come to him in honor and reverence and our need, and we praise him and thank him, and the words we use are ritualized, and the forms we use are ritualized. But as we use those words, our hearts are drawn into his presence, and our eyes are open to his grace, and we become a little bit more like what we ought to be, what we long to be. Think about the Lord's Supper. I mean, this ritualized recounting of Jesus' love for us in his sacrifice and we do it every week. 
And there are those traditions of Christianity who say, well, we're just going to do it once a quarter because after all, if you just ritualize it, you know, it gets to be a habit and pretty soon you don't pay attention to it anymore. We do it every week. We do it every week because we believe God, is, Jesus commanded us to do it every week, but we do it every week because it's good for us to have the habit of coming in here every week and remembering and reshaping and rethinking, and we know the love of Jesus, don't we? And our hearts are shaped by his love. But isn't it interesting that out of all of this ritual that we do that so shapes us and forms us into the image of Jesus, we complain about, ah, the same old, same old, and we're always looking for something new in worship. When it isn't newness and ritual that we need, it is close attention to what we are doing so that our hearts are shaped by it. You don't develop virtue by doing something new every moment. You develop virtue by repeating actions until they become habitual. Even worse, we tend to treat worship like it's irrelevant. Nah, if I miss, it's okay. If I'm not there, fine, no big deal. I can worship God somewhere else, you know, just as easily. When worship is probably the most important way our hearts are formed in the image of Christ. Paul will say, we who all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who's the spirit. Just as we just sit in the presence of the Lord and say, wow, we are being transformed. Secondly, second way of developing virtue is by perseverance. Doing right over the long haul, serving over the long haul, getting up every day and cleaning up your act working consistently at being the best person you can be. Not the most self-righteous person you can be, you know, all showy and I'm better than you, but being, but humbly admitting when you failed and secretly working to be more like Jesus in the way you act, in the way you talk, and even in the way you think. I've been reading Augustine's Confessions, and he talks about living the Christian life. And you know what he says living the Christian life is all about? Living the Christian life is all about being careful what you eat. I was shocked when he started talking about, here's, here's the mark of a real Christian. A real Christian watches what he eats. And I thought, what, are you nuts? Augustine says, I need to train myself to eat only what I need to be healthy and not what I want, because when I eat all that I want, I am only training myself to give in to my desires. So he says, I will be a true Christian when I learn to discipline the way I eat because then desire will not run my life, but I will be a person of virtue who does what is right because it's right. Ah, man, have you ever thought about that? Being good in all those little places? We just almost think it's trite, you know. We, I'm going to eat like a Christian. I'm going to dress like a Christian. I'm going to watch TV like a Christian. I'm going to play basketball like a Christian. I'm going to make my bed like a Christian. I'm going to drive like a Christian. I'm going to shop like a Christian. I'm going to park my car like a Christian. I'm going to cross the street like a Christian. You get the idea, don't you? Perseverance is not just... Sticking, over to the, uh, it's sticking to the big things over the long haul. Perseverance is consistently and regularly working on the little things that really matter. Watch your life and your doctrine. Oops, it's not here. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Jesus said something very terrifying. Oops. Jesus said something very terrifying in Matthew chapter 12. He says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. All that crude, rude, off-color stuff that tumbles out of your mouth when you're not even thinking. I don't know why I said that. I didn't mean to say that. Jesus said, that's a perfect, perfect indicator of where your heart is. And you'll have to give a reason for it on the day of judgment. And that's what's terrifying about that. All this stuff that we think don't ma doesn't matter, all this stuff that we think 
we have no control of all this stuff that we think just kind of is accidental with us that's the very stuff jesus said it's going to send you right to hell little things matter your conduct matters because actions have consequences because everything you do even the tiniest of things shapes the kind of person you are i'll give you a new heart and a new spirit he said i'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and i'll put my spirit in you and he does not say and then it won't matter what you do anymore Instead, what he says is, I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The Spirit is given by Jesus Christ. Peter the Apostle said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he'll put you on the way to happiness. Let's, let's stand and let's sing. If you need to respond to the gospel, would you please come while we're singing?